Hi, welcome back to the lecture series on GPU architectures and programming. In the last lecture, we have covered how OpenCL kernels can be partitioned across multiple devices and executed in case, I mean, and, and when it is advantageous and how that helps in terms of uh, gaining more, exploiting more concurrent execution. And uh, we have also understood that this is a facility available with OpenCL because the OpenCL kernels are, I mean, in case the vendor provides an OpenCL implementation for any device, the same kernel code can be mapped to different possible devices provided you have suitable OpenCL libraries in those devices. The next topic we like to touch in is how to use this concept in a general case where you have a, where you have applic application DAG, DAGs for directed acyclic graph and you want to execute this kind of an application on a, uh, on a sy system architecture, comp I mean where you have multiple devices. So, what we are assuming in this small example is say this is a task graph. So, you have three input buffers A, B and D. So, you have two, two, uh, you have two kernels who, who can execute initially in parallel, let us say K1 and K2. K1 let us say, this is again an example, it performs matrix multiplication. K2 takes one input buffer, all, for all the elements it performs square computation for each of the elements and uh, they produce their outputs in buffer C and E and these are basically buffers which are input buffers for the kernel K3 and uh, this kernel will again perform a, a matrix vector multiplication. Let us say this is a workload for us and we want to execute this workload on a system where you have a CPU and two GPU devices coming from the same vendor. So, I mean, so we can set up a context with these multiple devices and set up OpenCL queues for each of these devices. So, essentially uh, we will have to write a host program which will create the context for the platform. It will create three D OpenCL devices each having their own command queues and then you can enqueue the write, ND range and read operations for kernels K1 and K2 on two different devices that will run concurrently. Now, you have to choose that suitably, maybe you, you have a, you as a programmer understand that which kernel is more compute intensive, it has less divergence and all that and accordingly you can make choices, right. Uh, so, you, you can map this K1 and K2 to two of the devices and you synchronize until both the kernels finish execution. So, essentially you wait in the host code. Once both of the kernels finish execution, then you may want to, this is just an example mapping we are talking about, that you may want to map this <coughs> data space, this input data space which is C and E into two different GPU devices and launch two kernels K31 and K32 concurrently. So, what we are suggesting is, so here you have the buffer C full of data produced by K1 and the buffer E produced by data produced by K2, right. So, maybe we are again talking about a possible mapping. Let us say you have GPU device 1 and GPU device 2. You can copy a part of this here, right, a part of this here, a part of this here, a part of this here and then you can launch a kernel K31 here, you can launch a kernel K32 here, produce two outputs and then you copy to the host side memory, right, copy this to the host side memory to get the final output. You may want to do that in because you have multiple such devices available and in case <coughs> uh, this uh, data transfer, uh, I mean is not, I mean not a big overhead with respect to the computational gain you make by execution in parallel, in, if that is so, then you will like to do this operation, right. So, uh, this, this is some possible mapping that you can make and uh, <coughs> it, depending on the uh, kernel's uh, compute characteristics, it may have some advantage. Right. So, in general we understand that DAC scheduling is a complex problem because you have a architecture with multiple kinds of devices. Each kernel may have may map I mean in some specific way to some device like kernel K1 may 
give uh, some specific execution time in a CPU, it may give some different execution time on a GPU, right. So, first as a programmer you need to identify what is a good device to do the mapping and then you should like to set up the command queues and launch the kernels respecting the dependencies. For example, here as we discussed K1 and K2 do not have any dependency, but they, they are the, the execution of K3 depends on K1 and K2 both of them producing their outputs. So, K3, I mean I need to synchronize before executing K3 and then if required, if it is advantageous, then I may want to partition K3 and execute. So, as we can see that there can be many, many possible options like it may also make sense, let us say it all depends on the runtime scenario that if K2 is producing something and K2 is mapped to a device, shall I map K3 to the same device? Well, when will I want to do that? So, I will want to map K2 and K3 to the same device uh, in, in, a, in a situation because then this data transfer overhead from K2 to K3 will not exist, right. So, uh, <coughs> we have to figure out what is a good mapping. Well, I mean in case K2 is idle or K, I mean then uh, I mean the, the device where K2 has been mapped is idle, then that also may make sense, right. So, how to choose a mapping? What is the best mapping for a given application and an architecture is something that you have to fix. Here we are not discussing that problem, we are just trying to tell that well multiple mappings can be possible given an application and an architecture. As a programmer, you need to figure out what are the mapping characteristics what is a benefit in which case and accordingly decide. So, we are just trying to trying to motivate that if I if I map K2 and K3 together in a single device, it may be good because then I, I, I do not have this data transfer overhead or maybe when I, I mean there is something else, uh, maybe some, uh, some other job is there who for which I will like to use this device. So, then I will actually like to use K3 to uh, I mean and map it to some other device. Right. So, it is all a situation which you have to fix based on the options and all that. <coughs> so, this was one example of DAC scheduling that we went through. Now, so overall these are the factors that we will like to consider that what is the scheduling overhead, right. I mean uh, if we are uh, scheduling multiple kernels in multiple devices, then we have to do some bookkeeping like we have to wait on events, we have to perform data transfers. So, we have, these are the overheads which you have to take care of and we have to we have to say that well we will perform a scheduling decision only when the overheads actually I mean the benefits outweigh the overheads, right. So, the other other issue would also be that the granularity of workloads that how much you will like to uh, divide the problem. If you divide the problem a, into too many instances, then for each problem the number of threads become too thin to sustain any overhead that is associated with the kernel launch event. So, this is also important that whenever you are launching a kernel that has some overhead with respect to the runtime. Whenever you are actually doing a notify callback or you are executing a kernel based on the execution status of something else that also has a context switch overhead. So, all these switching overheads are there. So, if you define you divide the problem into too many instances and try to uh, solve it then the overheads will creep in and be, I mean far outweigh the advantage of parallelism that you may have, right. So, this, these things one has to figure out and also what you have to take care of whether the execution, what is the execution performance of the different devices. So, it is a heterogeneous compute platform, you may have multiple different GPUs. So, a kernel executing in one GPU with a performance metric in a different GPU may have a difference performance metric, right. So, these are all for factors that one has to figure out. The other topic we like to cover is device fission. So, like uh, there are several CPU devices uh, uh, from different vendors which support this concept of dividing the device in the OpenCL runtime system into smaller sub devices. For example, in general if you have one CPU, OpenCL will identify it as a device, right. But an SIMD, I mean a, a CPU, a modern CPU with multiple SIMD units it can be logically partitioned to several sub devices. So, in that case OpenCL system can identify them as separate sub devices and manage them separately, right. So, till date this idea of device fission is supported only on CPU like devices 
and it is possible to use device fission to build a portable and powerful threading application based on task parallelism. We will like to think that if there are such sub devices, then they can actually perform let us say overlapped execution to provide a more to explore task level parallelism and give us some optimized execution of, of our given SIMD kernel. So, we will not go in great detail about uh, I mean executing a program in multiple sub devices, but rather let us just discuss how to create such such devices. So, these are the options that are available till date in the OpenCL runtime system. You can use this API function CL create sub devices, but how you want to create the device partition? Uh, there are several options. So, you can create an array of sub devices using this call. Each of the sub device will refer a non intersecting set of compute units. So, suppose you have a set of compute units, in each sub device you will have a set of compute units which will not belong to the set of compute units for some other device. And uh, so, this partitioning of device, uh, the internal SIMD units of the CPU across sub devices can be has to be managed and uh, you can give uh, as a programmer you can give different directives that how to manage them. So, you can tell the runtime system that you well you use if you use this flag CL device partition equally and uh, then it will perform uh, the, the allocation of sub I mean compute units to sub devices following this flag. You can give it a by counts flag and also there is this option of affinity domain. Right. So, uh, there are different possibilities in which you can actually partition the sub device space. Uh, once the sub devices are created, uh, they can be they are they are they are very much like a normal OpenCL device. For them, you can create context, you can build programs, you can launch programs into command queues specified for such sub devices and all that, right. <coughs> so, these options you can just look into. We will just give a program example with one of the options, but of course, these are quite intuitive. So, <coughs> and uh, for a specific sub device, you can create a separate command queue, and, you, uh, and if you launch a command, it will get launched not into the entire device, but into that sub device. So, uh, let us have a look into this simple program. So, uh, first thing uh, we have to set up a device property uh, array using which you are trying to specify how the sub devices are defined, right. So, for this uh, you have to launch, you have to define an array, let us say we give it the name sub device properties, its type has to be CL device partition property and you have to give, the, you have to populate this array with the following elements. The first component has to be the primitive like what is your choice of partitioning uh, scheme. So, let us say I choose CL device partition equally, you distribute the sub devices equally and you have to specify what is the number of uh, sub devices you want. So, okay, sorry the first thing is CL device partition equally. So, whatever is the number of units available you you should you are saying that well you divide them equally across the number of sub devices and the number of sub devices you want is specified by this flag. Okay. So, once this array is set up you just make a call CL create sub devices you give it the device ID and you pass your requirements to this array and you give this thing that is what is the total number of compute units you have and divide it by the number of compute units you want per sub device. And this call will actually provide back the uh, handles to each of the sub devices inside this array sub devices. Okay. So, once this is done Next, you uh, let us let us look into how uh, you can uh, actually create queues and uh, engage the different sub devices. <coughs> so, <coughs> and also we like to say that here we are using the equal equally flag instead of that I can actually give explicit counts or I can specify an affinity domain, right. Mm, so, coming back to the command queues. So, this is the array in which I am trying to define command queues for each of the devices. So, in the for loop as you can see, uh, we are firing this CL create command queue command and uh, the number of times uh, this loop is going to rotate is exactly equal to the number of div sub devices which is the total number of compute, uh, compute units divided by number of compute units you want per sub device. 
So, that is the number of uh, subdivisors you have created and for each of them you are creating a separate command, command queue, right. Now, <coughs> so uh, that is how we actually create the set of subdivisors and you, are, you create separate, uh, separate command queues for each of the subdivisors. Now, what is the advantage of this like we have been discussing? Well, now you can issue commands in parallel across the different command queues for the subdivisors and that will help you to achieve overlapped execution. In case you want one subdivise to do something, you want some other subdivise to do some other thing. Let us say you want subdivise 1 to do some data copy operation while subdivise 2 is actually engaging to some executing some other kernel. So, like once the subdivises are created, they are really going to act like normal full fledged OpenCL devices to the programmers point of view, right. So, with this discussion about device fission and uh, properties of subdivises, we will like to end this lecture. Thank you.